are now continuing our Love Is series. Has it been blessing anybody? Our Love Is series, a series that has been designed and constructed by the Holy Spirit. I'm going to say this week after week until it sticks to your mind like adhesive. This is a series to remind us that the litmus test, the DNA for the Christian can be found in these four attributes, love, repentance, obedience, and giving God glory. Why is this important, Pastor? I'm going to tell you why. It's because you and I will not arrive at our God-ordained destination when we are allowing culture to be our map versus Scripture. Did y'all hear what I just said? We will never arrive at the places that God has ordained for us to arrive to, uh, ordained for us to arrive to when we are allowing culture to be our map versus Scripture. If the truth sets you free, then lies hold you hostage. And this series is exposing the lies of the enemy. The stuff that you thought was love is not love. It was really lust. It's exposing the lies of the enemy. I told us two weeks ago that this series is prophetic for many of us. It's a series that's reminding us that we are in a season of oil changes. You are not losing your mind, but you could be losing your will. I'm exchanging your will for my will. I'm exchanging your desires for my desires. I'm exchanging your passions for my passions. Oil changes. If you want to have oil to heal the brokenhearted, you must have had a season where the Holy Spirit healed yours. Oil changes. If you want oil to be a teacher, there must be a season in your life where God has been teaching you lessons and you passed. Because God is not like most of our educational systems. He won't pass you if you can't read. You're going to keep taking this test over and over and over and over until you get it. When your calling, hear me, when your calling is not normal or average, your warfare or your process won't be either. Already. When your calling, whatever God has ordained for you to do, when your calling is not normal, your warfare and your process will not be either. A foundational text that I want us to consider on this Sunday afternoon, Genesis chapter 37. We're going to launch our reading at verse 1. Genesis chapter 37. Verse 1, if you're ready, would you shout in the room, I'm ready. It says, now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. This is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers. And the lad was with his sons, Abilia, and the sons of Zilpah his father's wife, and Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Now Israel, remember God changed Jacob's name to Israel, so we're talking about the same person. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was a son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic. Certain translations say a robe. A tunic or a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they loved him. Oh, oh y'all paying attention today. They hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Our clause of concern, our verse of consideration, where we're going to park and unpack for our sermonic journey on this hot Sunday afternoon, lives and takes residence in verse 4 of our foundational text, where the scriptures tell us when the brothers saw that their father loved Joseph more than he loved them, they hated 
Joseph and could not speak peaceably to him. I would like to speak around this thought from this subject for just a few moments. Father wounds. Father wounds. Somebody say father wounds. Father wounds. When they saw that their father loved him, they hated him because their father loved him more than he loved them. See, many times when we're speaking about the story of Joseph, I've always heard Joseph's brothers preach about as they were haters. Anybody else? It's always seen as though their brothers were just haters. But as I was having my ear attentive to heaven this week and engaged in sermon prep, I saw something totally different. The reason they had this hatred was because of what their father loved more. They weren't just haters. It was due to Jacob's favoritism that caused for something to hit their heart. Watch this. They hated him because their father loved something more than them. So hate hit their hearts because of what their father loved more. Wounds hit their heart because of what their father loved more. Insecurities hit their heart because of what their father loved more. Anger hit their heart because of what their father loved more. And if we were to honestly audit our lives, if you look at this text, for many of us, we identify with Joseph's brothers. Our natural father didn't love Joseph more, but it's possible he loved alcoholism more. And that left a wound in our heart. Our natural father didn't love Joseph more, but he could have loved women more. And that left a wound in our heart. He could have loved money more. I'm trying to provide for the family. I'm trying to build the house and build a legacy for you. Okay, that's coming at the expense of you being physically present, but emotionally absent. Something has happened in our heart. Because of what our natural father loved more. As I was reading this interview this week about a phenomenal pioneer of the faith who goes by the name of Billy Graham. Heard of Billy Graham? Billy Graham, phenomenal leader of the faith. I mean, the type of stadiums. Look at this. Billy Graham led millions to Jesus. Millions. When Billy Graham spoke the world listened. He was labeled as America's preacher. Billy Graham, all of these, I may not ever be in a stadium and preach to that many people, but this was normal for Billy Graham. Billy Graham was so dope that at certain events, when the volunteers would put whites only here and coloreds only here, Whites only bathrooms here and colored only bathroom here. Billy Graham would say, take all that down. All the whites are sitting with the blacks and all the blacks are sitting with the whites. We're all blood covered. This was his language during the civil rights era. So this wasn't something that was normal. He said, we're all sitting together. So in this interview, they asked him before Billy Graham went home to be with the Lord. He said, man, you've done amazing things. Is there any regrets that you have? Billy Graham said, if there's a regret that I have, it would be that I didn't spend enough time with my kids. I had tons of bookings. Some were for God. Some I shouldn't have taken. But if I could do this all over again, instead of having the nation on my back, I'd rather have the sun on my back. I'd rather spend time with my kids more. It reminds me of a conversation I was having with my brother this Monday. I said, man, listen, on our deathbed, we are never going to wish we'd worked more hours at the office. Nobody on their deathbed is going to wish, man, I wish I posted that post. It's something about losing your youth, losing your hair, starting to see gray hairs form on your body that reminds you that life is a vapor. 
And something that really matters is your family. I'm understanding this now in, just the, in the genesis of my ministry tenure. I'm thankful for all of the opportunities that God is giving me. I'm thankful for the width that he's given the ministry. And I'm focused very intently on balancing how I serve the body and how present I am as a father. See, if I have somebody else preach up here weeks after weeks, you possibly will leave because you come for me and not for Jesus. And I don't want fans. I want followers of Jesus. I'm not pushing my brand. I'm not pushing me. Forget all that. You changed my life. No, Jesus did that. I'm just a hunk of dust just like you. I'm an imperfect man just like you. And so one of the things that I'm passionate about is I will not be a better servant to God's bride than my bride. I will not be more of a servant to the body than I am as a present father because if I do, it will affect their willingness to serve Jesus themselves. I never wanted to be said of my children, church took my daddy from me. Because please hear me, all men that are fathers are soon to be fathers. We are the point of reference to God. A father is the point of reference to the heavenly father. If you had a father that was real hard on you, you got to make straight A's. You got to make varsity. You got to make the team. And you didn't. And they're disappointed in you. And don't talk to you. Well, what do you think happens when you sin? When you fall short? When you miss the mark? You start to feel the same way your natural father felt about you? Maybe my heavenly father feels the same way about me too. If we had fathers who didn't keep their word, we said we were going to show up, but we didn't. We said we were going to play tonight, but we didn't. Talk, Holy Spirit. We said we would be there, but we didn't. When something like a pandemic happens, a layoff happens, we begin to wonder, will our Heavenly Father not show up too? Because fathers are the point of reference to God. Please hear me. Children don't spell love, L-O-V-E. They spell it T-I-M-E. Okay. The iPad doesn't spell L-O-V-E. YouTube doesn't spell L-O-V-E. What spells love to children is T-I-M-E. Time. Father wounds. They hated him because of what the father loved more. Watch this. When we have wounds that haven't healed correctly we will end up mistreating your blessing. <laughs> Y'all missed it. Because Joseph was going to be the provision for his brothers later. But due to father wounds, they were mistreating what God was going to use to show his love later. This is so good, y'all. Mistreat blessings when we have unchecked Wounds. It will leave bruises on our heart that will cause for you to mistreat your Joseph. Mistreat your blessing. So what you're going to do is you're going to make a good man pay for what a wrong man did. It's going to get quiet and hot in here. The mistreatment of blessings. So what you're going to do is, sir, you're going to make a good woman pay. For what a wrong woman did. What you're going to do is. You're going to make a good pastor. A good spiritual leader pay. For what a bad pastor did. For what a wolf in sheep clothing did. You're going to make a good friend pay. For what a bad friend did. How many more people are going to have to pay the subscription fee of your paranoia. Because of your trauma you haven't dealt with. I told you it's going to be rough. How many more people have to pay the subscription fee of your paranoia? I didn't mean it like that. I didn't even mean that. Girl, I wouldn't even think about that. No, bro, it's cool. How many more people are going to have to pay the subscription fee of your paranoia because we have unchecked wounds that we have not dealt with? Father wounds. I said all of that to say, sometimes our father wounds are limiting our ability to display the Father's love. 
Father wounds. Father wounds. Father wounds. Father wounds. It is generational bacteria that has infected and affected our hearts to where we struggle with loving people back. Father wounds. Father wounds. Father wounds. It's when our father broke our heart before a man ever did. Father wounds. Father wounds. Father wounds. It's yes, he was absent, but I'm still affected by it in my present. Father wounds. Father wounds. Father wounds. And we have to discuss this church family. We have to discuss this because, first off, I don't know why anybody would use the term daddy issues as an insult. Especially men. How are we going to use that term when it's our gender that caused them to be like that? You got daddy issues. So we're going to drag single mothers when they're the one that stayed? Father wounds. Father wounds. We have to talk about this because one of the multi multifaceted warfare strategies of the enemy is to take out the man. There is a satanic assault. I feel this, y'all. There is a satanic assault right now that's plaguing the earth over our sons, over our husbands, over our brothers, our nephews, our uncles, our fathers, our grandfathers. There is a warfare strategy right now to take out the man because the man is the gatekeeper of the home. We're the gatekeeper of the home. We're the ones that are supposed to stand in the doorway of our home and say nothing gets in this house without first trying to get through me. <laughs> nothing can come in this house without first coming through me. Not a devil, not a demon, not an unclean spirit, not a Jezebel spirit, a Delilah spirit. One of the ways I protect my family is by protecting them from spirits. How do you do that? Don't entertain other spirits. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. When a kingdom man is in the home, the household hits different. This isn't a male bashing sermon. This is reminding us of the original kingdom agenda. The enemy knows it's easier to overtake a kingdom when there's no king present. It's easier to overtake a kingdom when there are men there who won't fight. We need to get men who fight back in place. I'm not talking about fight with your fist. I know that you can fight with your fist, but can you fight with your faith? I know that you can fight with your fist. But can you fight with your faith? It gets hard, I'm not giving up. It's hard, I'm not folding. It's hard, I'm not throwing in the towel. It's hard, I'm not walking away. This is biblical manhood. I know that you can fight with your fist, but can you fight in worship? When you see me on my knees, that doesn't mean I'm weak. That means I'm getting stronger. That's not a feminine attribute. Real kingdom men worship. I know that you can fight with your fist, but can you fight with your praise? Because praise can be your weapon, and God inhabits the praises of his people. I know that you can fight with your fist, but can you fight with fasting? Because fasting strengthens your no. And kingdom men have to know how to say no to temptation and yes to the will of Jesus. Can you fight in the spirit? I know. I know we don't like this. It's not your typical Father's Day message, but I understand what is happening. There's a warfare strategy, and it's always been, and it always will be. Take the man out. Is this not what Scripture tells us in Exodus chapter 1? Verse 16, how many times do I have to read this scripture? Exodus chapter 1, verse 16, when Pharaoh says, hey, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbearing on the delivery stool, if you see that it is a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, let her live. Is this not what the text tells us in Matthew chapter 2? Verse 16, when Herod said, hey, all two-year-old male babies, if it's a boy, kill him. 
there's something hell fears about men reaching maturity. So if I can get them to have triggers before they develop muscles, if I can take them out there, if it's a boy, kill him. Kill his esteem. Kill his confidence. Kill his identity. Kill his commitment. Kill him. I want to take him out now because I don't want them to mature, which is why I stated last year, snakes like eggs. I want to consume it before it ever hatches and grows. I want trauma to hit you before you hit puberty. I want insecurity to hit you before you become a man so that you will never redeem the original kingdom agenda because cycles are indicators of, in, of internal holes. And what is not healed properly can't be reflected accurately. Say that one more time. What is not healed properly cannot be reflected accurately. I'm doing this because I believe God wants to redeem and raise up kingdom men. I'm talking about world changer men. We won't bow to the culture kingdom men. I'm not listening to Delilah's whispers kingdom men. Men who won't compromise. You won't cheer louder for a football team than you will with your fatherhood and with your faith. Enough with me meowing with your faith but roaring for the culture. God is raising up some sons of Zion who won't bow, who won't bend, who won't break. We're not perfect. But God is redeeming the kingdom man. So when they look at your life years later, you'll be able to tell them, I didn't die, I developed. So good, y'all. I didn't die, I developed. Father wounds. Father wounds. It is the enemy's tactic to distort the view of the father. So hopefully we can have a distorted view of the heavenly father. But watch this. Watch what Jesus says. When one of his disciples rolled up on him and said, Master, can you, can you teach us how to pray? Look, I want you to see what Jesus says. Luke chapter 11, verse 1. says, Now it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. As John also taught his disciples. So Jesus said to them, when you pray, say, our Father. Look, 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 look. He didn't say, when you pray, say, our Creator. That would have been accurate. He didn't say, when you pray, say, our Savior. That would have been accurate. But he said, no. When you go before God, listen, he's given us the model on how to pray. You address him as daddy. Intimacy. I need you to know that the creator of the universe is your daddy. I need you to know that the maker of all things is your daddy. How insecure are you right now because you don't view God as your daddy? Jehovah Jireh, that's your daddy. Elohim, that's your daddy. The eternal king, that's your daddy. I want you to crush all the titles. And when you pray, view him as Abba. View yourself as a son. As a son. View yourself as a daughter that can sit on your daddy's lap. And tell him what hurts you. That's, that's how I want you to view your father. But hell attempts to distort the view of fathers in an attempt to distort our view of the heavenly father. Now, when I was growing up, I noticed culture seemed to try to present to us good visuals of fathers. There was this one father. I don't know if y'all remember him. Do y'all remember Uncle Phil? Y'all yeah. don't know who that is. <laughs> Uncle Phil. He's like, 
Uncle Phil on Fresh Prince. See that look on Uncle Phil's face? That scene when Will was passionate about his daddy leaving. He said, why don't he want me? And Uncle Phil hugged him. It seemed as though culture was trying to present to us a good image of a father. Oh, what about, y'all may not know this one dude. What about Carl Winslow? Y'all remember him? Carl Winslow from Family Matters. He was a cop. There for Eddie. There for Laura, Richie, and even there for Steve Urkel. Which I don't think there was ever an episode where we saw Steve Urkel's daddy. But... He was always the daddy to Steve Urkel that Steve Urkel never had. And even this one show, don't judge me. Do y'all remember this one daddy, Danny Tanner? Somebody said no. Okay, I remember him. We have multi races in the church right now. Did this one daddy, Danny Tanner, and this full house was actually full. There was like Uncle Jesse was there to help too. There was Uncle Joey cut it out. Like, y'all remember that, right? It seemed as though culture was trying to present to us an image of good fathers. Now, this next dude is going to cause triggers, I know, but he was considered America's dad. Do y'all remember Cliff Huxtable? See how quiet he got? Okay. I already know what you're thinking. I know. But believe it or not, he was referred to as... America's dad. And I was watching this documentary of people just, I mean, they're ripping Bill Cosby to shreds due to the allegations and things that he admitted to. And some people never even watched the Cosby show. Never met Bill, but were just saying some horrible stuff about him. I was like, man, this sounds personal. And I was watching this interview with a pastor, amazing pastor in New York called Pastor A.R. Bernard, and he mentioned this, Bill Cosby, and he said, man, I noticed that a lot of people really hate him, and he said exactly what I didn't know how to articulate, but it made sense. He said, you know why I think people hated him, hate him so much? Because he represented the father we never had. He was America's dad. And when we find out that the character didn't match the character. Some people got it. When we found out the character of Cliff Huxtable didn't match the character of Bill Cosby. There's a lot of pain that hit our heart. Right now, some of us, the person that we called father, or we may have never have known as father, the character doesn't match the title. And so there's a different level of pain that happens when we see all of these fathers that culture now has brought allegations on all of them. (laughs) All of them. Because the enemy's goal is to distort the image of fathers. This is so powerful, y'all. To distort our view of the Heavenly Father. I'm going to go deeper. In Catholicism, Pope. Holy Father. Father Pope, who have generations been molesting boys. So I got counsel from you and you are molesting my son at the same time. It is hell's attempt to distort the view of the natural father. So we can have a distorted view of the Heavenly Father. I'm going to keep on going. The founding fathers of America. (laughs) The founding fathers of America, all of them had slaves. The only one that freed them later was George Washington. All of them, 12, the first 12 presidents of the United States. Out of the 12 of them, 8 of them had slaves. They go and had babies with them, children with them. Okay, I'm going to give you some more facts. All right. Out of the 17 out of 55 delegates to the Constitutional Convention, a total of 1,400 slaves was owned by all of them. Why? Because it is hell's attempt. Are y'all getting this? It is hell's attempt to distort the view 
of fathers so that it would distort the view of the, of the heavenly father. This is so powerful, y'all. And I know that this is uncomfortable. I know that this could be awkward for some of us. But I, I'm just convinced I'm not the only one who has noticed how fatherlessness is plaguing our communities. I know I'm not the only one that's noticed. I know I'm not the only one that has noticed that there seems to be a famine of kingdom men. I know I'm not the only one that's noticed. I know I'm not the only one that's noticed that there are a caliber, not all of us, but there are a caliber of men who love the baby making process but can't stand the, ra- the baby raising responsibility. Like y'all could touch on all over each other's bodies, but she can't touch your phone. Make it make sense. She's insecure. You don't have to hide what you're not doing, bro. God, hear me. God is always going to call Adam first. Even though Eve ate the fruit first, he's always going to call Adam first. I'm right here with you, sir. It may not be your fault, but it is your responsibility. Now, while y'all clapping, ladies, make sure you keep that same energy when we're trying to act responsible. When we're trying to see our children. When we're trying to lead our house. Keep that same energy. When we're trying to be the husband, keep that same energy. All right. You clap over that. But when it's time for us to lead. <laughs> Can I, get us, can I get us to say this? Everybody watching online, could you put this in the room in all caps? Can I get us to say this? Father, heal me, Father, heal me. From, anything from anything that would limit, that would limit my, ability my ability to display your love. To display your love. One more time. Father, heal me, Father, heal from, me. From, anything from anything that would limit, that would limit my, ability my ability to display your love. Church family, the reason... We're dealing with this. I'm so passionate about it. For installment number four of our Love Is series. See, we could have just cracked open 1 Corinthians 13 and each week could have been that. Part one, love is patient. Part two, love is kind. We could have did that. But I really strive to hear what God is saying. And what he was really revealing to me is there's layers why we're not loving Christians. There are layers to it. And so what the Holy Spirit prompted for me to speak on two weeks ago, this was in my heart two weeks ago, was, listen, I need, number one, for them to understand that God is trying to redeem the original kingdom agenda for the home. Can I get somebody to say for the home? home. This has been strangling our ability to display the love of Jesus Because there's two points I want us to remember, and that is, number one, biblical love should first be seen in the home. It should first be seen in the home, and then number two, it should be experienced in the home. I know it's not common. I know. But just because it's not common does not mean God has changed his standard. Nobody does that anymore. Okay, God's word still stands. The original kingdom agenda was for biblical love to be experienced in the home, seen in the home, not with your girlfriend, but with your wife and your husband. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and not cleave to his girlfriend, but cleave to his wife. Husbands, love your wife like Christ loved the church. That's the original kingdom agenda. I know it's not common, but that does not... Ooh, I'm about to get in trouble. Y'all not going to like me for about the next five minutes. See, the enemy is behind sexual immorality. 
We're going to deal with that next Sunday. Part five is going to be bedroom confessions. Because a lot of this stuff, hear me, a lot of this stuff that we're calling love is really lust. They don't love you, they lust you. Love gives, for God so loved the world, he gave. Love gives, lust takes. Love sacrifices, lust is selfish. The enemy is behind this sexual immorality. You know why? It's not because you're just so fly, bro, she's sliding in your DMs. The reason he's behind sexual immorality is because he wants to perpetuate the narrative of broken households. It's no, it has nothing to do with you being a hot girl. It has nothing to do with you being a fly guy. It has everything to do with, I need your seed, sir, so I could put that in the womb of a wrong pick. I need your womb, ma'am. I need it. That's how I keep dysfunction in the bloodline. Sex. I need your womb with the wrong seed to keep something in your blood. Hell is behind womb with womb and seed with seed. I'm not scared to say it. If you want to tickle me, Elmo Christianity, there are a ton of mega churches that will tell you what you want to hear and motivate you to spiritual death. I didn't come here to tickle your ears. I came in to tell you the truth. The enemy is behind womb with womb. The enemy is behind seed with seed. Why? Because it perverts God's original command in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, when he says, be fruitful and multiply. Womb with womb can't be fruitful and can't multiply. Seed with seed can be fruitful and multiply, which is why every fruit you eat has seeds in it. If it doesn't, it has been manipulated by man. Let me go ahead and say something that's going to mess people up. Hell is behind Pride Month. Hell is behind it. How could you say that? Proverbs 16 verse 18. Pride comes before destruction. And a haughty spirit before a fall. The devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Okay. Pride comes before destruction. He's behind it. I didn't come to tickle ears. I came to tell the truth. I am not going to stand before God and say, I lied to your people for likes. Certain people won't preach it. They won't touch it because they want to be politically correct. I'm trying to be biblically correct. The enemy, I'm trying. The enemy is behind sexual immorality because it perpetuates a narrative of broken households. Remember, the original kingdom agenda is for biblical love to be seen in the home and experienced in the home. And one of the main ways he does this is with sexual immorality. Hell hates when we have a holy reference. He hates when you have examples. So if I could move the reference giver out of position, then we'll have men who have no point of reference. Because hell can't stand when we have a holy reference. Look, let me give you some more Bible. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, it says, Let no one despise your youth, but be an example. To the believers, how? In word? How else? In conduct? How else? In uh oh, love? How else? In spirit? How else? In faith? How else? In purity? Woo! That purity part stung. Didn't <laughs> this is the original kingdom agenda. I'm learning this, family. More is caught than taught. More is caught than taught. And in our households, most of us have caught something. Households come with templates. A template, how your mom was, how she wasn't. Whatever, whatever your 
childhood experience was you caught a template. So you end up walking with this template, making decisions from this template, having a perspective from this template. Then you end up marrying somebody and you recognize you got a person, but you also got their template. This is why I believe sometimes we experience divorce because you had a template before you ever had a candidate. And so you give them lies to recite because you knew the character you wanted them to be before you ever met them because you already had a template. You know why this teaching is hitting so hard? Because most of us have a template and it's clashing with teaching. I don't do paper. I'm, I'm good. I don't do people. Okay, that's your template. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples by the way you love one another. That's teaching. Sound doctrines clashing with your template. I'm, I don't need nobody. I'm straight. Bag, bag. Give me 50 feet. I'm good. Forsake not the fellowship among the saints. We are many members of one body. That's teaching, clashing with your template. And so when you leave here, you feel wrecked. And it's because God's word is literally a wrecking ball to your template. This is so good, man. It's going to be hard. Hear me. It's going to be hard for you to digest what biblical love is when you keep on viewing culture as your mirror. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6, where you can see this. I'm not preaching my opinion. I preach doctrine. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house. I love when the word of God compliments. You shall talk about them. When you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. More Bible. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline of and instruction of the Lord. Problem, how can you bring them up if you never show up? <laughs> Kingdom men are joy contributors, not trauma deliverers. Okay, fathers actually set up ladders. Every father sets up a ladder. They're either setting you up to push you up, or they have set up things to weigh you down. Fathers, kingdom men set our family up with blessings. That's the original kingdom agenda. I'm going to show you text and scripture all day. We set our family up with blessings. Not weigh them down and force them to need healing because we handed them burdens. I know that this isn't the norm. And I know that this isn't common. But this is the standard that we're striving to get back to. All of us, from the pulpit to all of the chairs, all of us have messed up. Every, nobody's perfect. What we're seeing on today is God's original kingdom agenda. And now from this day forward, let's make decisions to get back to the original kingdom agenda. That's it. Fathers set up ladders. Who can I show y'all something that really blessed me? Okay, three people said yes, so I'm going to ask again. Can I show y'all something that really blessed me? All right, I want y'all to see this. Um, Genesis chapter 28. We're going to go a little deeper right now. Genesis chapter 28. Verse 10, it says, Now Jacob went out from Beersheba toward Haran, so he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it on his head, and he laid down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder 
was set up on the earth and its top reached heaven. And there are angels of God who were ascending and descending on it. Remember, Father set up ladders. All right, now, John chapter 1. This is so good. John chapter 1, verse 51. Jesus is speaking. Listen what the king of glory says. Jesus says, and he said to him, most surely I say to you, hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the son of man. Did y'all catch this? Yeah. Yeah. Jacob dreams he sees a ladder. Right. And on the ladder he sees angels ascending and descending. Jesus comes along and says, okay, hereafter you're going to see on the Son of Man. Right. Jesus is the ladder. Ascending and descending angels. What does this mean? Jesus is the connection to the Father. Because Father set up ladders. And the father knew that sin already messed us up. So I'm going to set y'all up with my love in the form of my son. This is so good, y'all. I'm a father to the fatherless. I've set up a ladder so that everything you need, if you need peace, that's going to descend to you. If you need joy, that's going to descend to you. How? In the prince of peace. So good. Father set up ladders. This this is usually how it starts. We have wounds. Something happened in 1895 that was passed on to 1921. That's your great-grandmother. Then it passed on to your grandmother in 1962. And then it passed on to your mother in 1991. All of these are wounds that are staying in a bloodline. Because hear me. Wounds form tollways in bloodlines. I'm preaching so passionately because I'm trying to get us a people who stop paying the toll. One more time. Wounds form tollways in bloodlines. I'm doing this series to try to convince the people to stop paying the toll. The satanic forest fire has been burning down a tree of generation after generation, but somebody has to not be afraid of heat. So, the wound started way back in 1895, and it's still present in our bloodline today in 2023, and it's affecting you currently. So why would the enemy use this as his methodology. Because if I can get you to be bound by bloodline trauma and all the wounds in your blood, you're going to miss a promise. This is so good. This is so good. There are promises that God has for you. Okay? But your ability to love, repent, obey, and give God the glory are going to be the determining factor if you receive the promise. And God is so faithful to where if you don't get the promise, I'm going to try to give it to your kids. I have a promised land for you. But if you don't learn how to detox from Egypt, if you don't let me detox you from what happened... Your children will experience the promise, and you might have been supposed to experience it. How, how, do we, how do we get to this place where we get better? I'm glad you asked. Point number one, wound awareness. Wound awareness. You can't fight a stronghold you don't know exists. Wound awareness. You can't close a door that you don't know is open. I promise you, family reunion, Thanksgiving, if you watch close enough, you'll see them. You'll see them. And in many times, God opens up your eyes for you to see this so that you could break that. Now, for everybody who shouts, I'm a cycle breaker, praise God. Okay. 
for you to experience this, this is not going to like this. Did that make sense? Okay. If you are going to break this, you have a lot of problems from this. Because cycle breakers are misunderstood. Wound awareness. All of us got hurt from this. Notice how every single time you're stressed, you get alcohol. And I guarantee you, if you look back on the bloodline, it's possible mama did it too. Because wounds hover over bloodlines. And these wounds oftentimes form shelter for spirits. Point number two, after you have wound awareness, you hear all this, okay, what am I supposed to do about it? Okay. After you have wound awareness, you have to allow Abba to heal the wound. Weed's not going to do it. You tried it. You've got high so many times. When the buzz fades, you still pissed. Sex is not going to feel it. Sex, cheap sex is like cheap food. It messes your heart up. You tried it. You tried to get faded. You tried to go to the hookup bar. You tried relationships. Have you noticed none of that stuff works? You can't treat a spiritual issue with a natural remedy. You can't. You've been trying to do everything you can. It won't work because spiritual needs will never be fixed with natural remedies. Okay. John, 1 John chapter 3. Verse 1, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. Matthew chapter 7, verse 9 and 11, I'm going fast because I'm out of time. Which of you, if you ask your son for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then... Though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask? Allow Abba to heal the wound. Romans chapter 8 verse 15. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves. So that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received bought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. And the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Amen. What does our Heavenly Father do? And this is something that I strive to line myself up to, to kind of measure how good of a father I am. Good fathers do these three things. Provision, protection, Affection. Okay? Provision, protection, and affection. And all of those are a display of love. I love you. You know I love you. Do you show provision, protection, and affection? The affection is messing us up. Because we think affection is soft. Your son needs that from you, Dad. He needs that from you. He needs, I'm proud of you. Notice once Jesus was baptized, once he came out of the water, his father said, this is my beloved son. In him I'm well pleased. What was that affirmation? Sons need to be told, I'm proud of you. From fathers or father figures. Last point, vow to stop the cycle. There's no healing and blaming. There's no healing and blaming. Vow to stop the cycle. Because if you don't, all of these wounds that got pent on generations before us and 
ancestors before us, if we don't deal with them right, they'll all be on you. They're gone. But they're alive in you. You're praying for this. God said, okay, let me first take that. Let me take that. Only I can heal it. Only I can heal it. You tried everything else. Give it to me. God, heal us from any wound. Some of us might have been hearing this teaching and been like, it was my mama who messed me up. Regardless of the transportation method or vehicle, we understand that you're a good father. But if we be honest, sometimes it's hard to say that because we've never seen one. It's hard to sing you're a good, good father. That's who you are. When I didn't experience that naturally. You told us in Psalms that you're a father to the fatherless. God, don't let us just quote that. Can you help us experience it? I believe I speak on behalf of many of your children. We're tired of quoting what we've never experienced. Would you open our eyes so that we could see why we're not experiencing it? And heal us so that we won't be great at delivering the word, but poor at the word delivering us. I pray right now, God, for every man, every woman under the sound of my voice who has had a wound in their heart because they love something that they didn't love. They love things that didn't love them back. Help us to know that you're not like that. Please give us a discernment to be able to recognize wrong representations aren't the way you are. And your character matches your word. Heal us so that we don't pass on to our children and our children's children wounds that existed centuries before us. It stops with us. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody who agrees to that prayer would just shout in the room, amen. amen. Was this good on today? I know it was rough. Say it again. I don't know what you're saying. Yeah, come on. I don't know what you're saying. So all men 21, year, 21 years of age and up, we have a gift for you. So don't, yes, we like to honor fathers and men, period. So don't leave without us giving uh, you your gift. And also for everybody who caught the shuttle, it's um, low-key hellish outside. So we don't want you to stand in that. So if you caught the shuttle, we're asking for you to remain in here until it's your time to catch the shuttle because AC is better than Houston's heat. Okay, so un un until God gives us the building and we're pursuing it, y'all, we're chasing it. I've been praying every day, every day. I know it's coming, but it, since it's coming, listen, while it's coming, please deal with us with the temporary discomfort, the temporary discomfort, because soon, and I'm praying this year, we will all be in the building together and we'll be like, you remember when? So I, I thank you for dealing with us as we're transitioning. This is God's church, his people. I, I did have anxiety about it last year until a, a pastor friend of mine, Jonathan Evans, was like, bro, that's God's church, man. He was like, you don't understand. He's doing this fast. Y'all know we've only been preaching Sunday in person for one year. This is one year. One year, 12 o'clock service started January of 2022. This is one year. 
He said, man, God's going so fast, you don't even see it, bro. He said, wait for four years. And so I need other pastor friends in my ear to remind me, just focus on preaching the word, man. Serve people. So, sorry, all that kind of stirred me off. But if you desire to make this your church home, um, we're not a perfect church, but we do serve a perfect God. If you would text the word membership to this number on the screen behind me, um, there'll be a video of me popping up saying that you make one of the best decisions that you ever made in your life. This is your spiritual gym, and you can't get in shape working out one day a week. So we have discipleship on Wednesday, small groups where you can connect because we need each other. If you haven't accepted Christ, I want us to all say this prayer <clears throat> together. Can I get us to say, Father, Father I, need I need you. I am done, I am done. with trying to live life, to live life. My, way. my way. Would you save me? Save you me. told me in your word. If I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the grave, I shall be saved. I believe it. Now train me and disciple me. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you put your hands together for everybody who prayed that?